and I will let everyone in now. Okay, so there are about 50 of us. So I want to start off by saying welcome to you all. And of course, welcome to our two speakers. It's very, very good to see you all here. Um, I'm going to start off by setting a few ground rules. So my name is Brett Bly. I'm the co-director of the Center for Technology Enhanced Learning at Lancaster University. Um, this is one of a number of events being run on Zoom, and it's useful usually to set out um, how people might work in the meeting from the beginning. So I would advise you, if you wish to keep on your uh, webcams, it's quite good from the point of view of being a speaker to be able to know that you're talking to real people. But please do um, turn off your microphones unless you're deliberately uh, planning to, to say something. Uh, the meeting is being recorded, and the idea is that this recording would be put up and made publicly accessible later. That means if you do um, say something, then you're likely to appear in the recording. If you don't want to appear in the recording, then the way to do that is to ask your question in the text chat and I can read it out for you and you don't need to appear in the recording. There'll be a number of periods at which um, you'll be invited to uh, pose questions. And at that point, you can say, I want to ask a question in the text chat and either myself or Catherine will ask you to come on and ask your question, or you can write it there and I will read it for you. So those are going to be your two options. Um, those are mainly the ground rules. That's uh, fairly simple, but that's as it should be. So now I'll hand over to Catherine, who's going to talk about the event. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Catherine Hasted from the University of Cambridge. Um, thank you all for being here. It's so exciting. Um, and one of the lovely things that we've that has come out of lockdown um, across the world is this ability to connect institutions. So it's the first time that we've met, so the University of Lancaster and the University of Cambridge, and with our esteemed colleagues, colleagues from Finland as well. So um, really looking forward to today. Great to see you. Um, we hope it's going to be a really interactive session. Um, yeah, so we're thrilled to invite Professor Engström, um, Emeritus Professor of Education at the University of Helsinki, and Director of the Centre for Research on Activity Development and Learning, Cradle. Um, for those of you who want to look it up, it's a fantastic organisation to look at. Um, and we're also delighted to welcome Professor Annalisa Sanino uh, from Tampa University. Um, I know that many of you are intimately um, aware of uh, the work of our two colleagues, because I know how many people have cited them, um, Brett and I included on a regular basis. Um, but for those of you who haven't um, met our guests today, I just wanted to share some insights. So they have incredibly distinguished careers working right across the globe um, to advance understanding about cultural historical activity theory, particularly through the use of formative interventions. So the change laboratory is the focus of today. Um, and their, their achievements are too numerous to mention. So I thought it'd be helpful to kind of share um, insights about the, the two things that really shine out when you look at their work. So the first is the generosity that they both do in collaborating and sharing their knowledge with colleagues across the globe. So that's particularly through the work that they do um, Cradle, but also connections they have with universities in South Africa and America and Sweden, to name but a few. Um, and we're so grateful that they're joining our two universities um, today and giving us so much time. We really appreciate it. The second thing that really strikes you is the impact of their work. So, you know, all of us know that as a buzzword now, but they really have been delivering that both through what they do themselves at Cradle, but also the ripple effect of the number of people that have picked up the Change Laboratory. Um, and on the call today, so we have colleagues um, from Lancaster from the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning, but also the University of Cambridge Think Lab team, both um, are applying the change laboratory methodologies. So between all of us, it's been applied in, within National Health Service in the UK, in libraries um, across the, the globe, in universities, the army, um, and a whole range of different situations that I think will probably come to light as we have the conversations later today. So it's really exciting. Um, not only is this conversation going to help us in terms of building our knowledge, but I really think there's going to be impact from the discussions that we have and the networks that we make. And it would be fantastic if we could keep some of those 
interactions going into the long term. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us, um, particularly Professor Engelstrom and Professor Zanino. We're so excited about this session and over to you. Okay, thank you. This was a flattering introduction. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, um, we um, have planned it so that um, we have divided the time so that first I will speak perhaps about 40 minutes, um, especially focusing on the change laboratory and uh, expansive learning. Then um, um, if there are some immediate questions and, and maybe a couple of immediate questions, but then uh, you probably will need a five. And, and then uh, Annalisa will take over and she will speak about the uh, change laboratory and transformative agency by double stimulation. Uh, so, uh, and these two are intimately interconnected and, and uh, I'm sure that um, uh, at the same time, there is perhaps progression uh, because Annalisa's recent work on uh, transformative agency by double stimulation is, is, is quite new. And in, in a way, it's very much at the cutting edge of, of what is being done with the change laboratories right now. And uh, um, uh, difficult questions and, and uh, uh, nice comments. So um, uh, we'll try to stick to that. Uh, and uh, if, for instance, I uh, exceed my time, I'm, I'm sure that somebody will uh, give me a little note. Uh, that's uh, um, a risk always. Um, and um, if you want, if you if you don't feel that you, there is a, enough time for you to present your comment or question uh, orally, just please use the chat. And even if we don't uh, have a possibility to answer uh, all the questions and comments. Uh, that you may put in the chat, they, they'll be saved and we can return to them later in, in, in that case. Anyway, so thank you for, for being with us. And, and I will now start sharing my, my PowerPoint. Is it becoming visible? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, excellent. I'm not very smooth with this. Um, and um, so I start with a few uh, words about the change laboratory, just as a as a um, as an uh, instrument in itself, uh, just to get you uh, perhaps familiarized. If if this is something entirely new. Um, and um, we are dealing here with the, an intervention method. Um, and the emergence of, of this method or uh, this uh, approach uh, is connected to the more general phenomenon in, in uh, many social sciences, particularly in education, but also in, in many other social and human sciences a sort of uh, gradual rise of uh, intervention research, which has to do with the, with the search for increased impact and increased societal relevance of research. In education particularly, there is a, this uh, became noticeable um, in the early 1990s when uh, colleagues, uh, particularly Anne Brown, um, uh, launched the notion of what they call design experiments. And later it's been uh, sort of renamed design-based research. Um, it's, the idea of design-based research uh, is to um, do sort of natural experiments in real uh, life settings, such as schools or, or other um, uh, institutions and communities in which um, learning um, should be studied in actual contextual 
uh, uh, setting rather than uh, separated uh, from its uh, you know, contextual factors uh, uh, and turn into, a, uh, into laboratory experiment or, or merely statistics. So <clears throat> the design-based research uh, idea was that uh, research uh, should operate by designing new models for educational practice, new models for learning and instruction, implementing them in multiple iterations and, and collecting data uh, from these iterations so that it actually would generate uh, robust new models and, and, uh, and uh, uh, practices for learning and instruction. Um, from the point of view of, of our approach, cultural historical activity theory, this um, approach has some limitations. One major limitation is that in this traditional design-based research, initially, it was always the researcher who did the design. And the participants, teachers, and learners were basically implementing the design. They could um, contribute to the um, modifications of the design, but the actual design work was done by researchers. And this um, is something which, um, in a way, um, creates a, a question of uh, where's the learner's agency? And this is central for uh, on activity theoretical perspective that we actually are working with learners, with people who uh, are embedded in their um, work activities or other activities and, and try to transform them. And that the design ultimately is in the hands of those practitioners and learners. Researchers uh, collaborate and, and uh, negotiate with them and uh, bring in uh, conceptual tools and, and instruments that may be beneficial. Uh, but in the end, it's not the researcher's design. It is the practitioners and learners own designs which are being um, uh, created and implemented. Um, so, and the, the other limitation that we see in the design-based research, which is closely connected to the first one, is, is that if it's a researcher's design, it's typically uh, predefined what the aim is. The researcher pre predefines uh, the, the sort of desired end result. And this uh, clearly um, limits the, the scope of what this type of research can generate. Um, we uh, call our approach formative interventions, meaning that, that they are formative in, in the sense that the end result, the outcomes of uh, the interventions are actually generated, formed, in the intervention by the participants rather than predetermined ahead of time. Uh, <clears throat> now this type of approach, what we call formative intervention methodology um, has uh, recently started to receive increased uh, attention also among uh, people who represent rather, let's say, um, strong traditions in the learning sciences. Uh, one noticeable uh, example is uh, Jim Greeno, who unfortunately recently passed away, but uh, who has been a sort of a very central figure in the learning sciences, especially uh, promoting ideas of situatedness. And uh, um, in, a, in a special issue of uh, the Journal of the Learning Sciences in 2016, uh, uh, devoted to the sort of interface between activity theoretical and design-based research. Um, he uh, it took a very uh, strong stance uh, in favor of formative intervention type, uh, type of research, as you can see this in this quote that is on the screen. And uh, I think uh, these kinds of, of sort of insights that are very valuable for us because there's always a risk that you become a sort of a, a sect 
that you, uh, you have your own uh, theory and your own often rather uh, complicated concepts and, and terminologies, etc. And then you just speak to the, each other rather than to the broader world. And uh, it is very important that, that this kind of boundaries are continuously broken and that we actually speak above all to practitioners in different fields, teachers, um, but also all kinds of practitioners in their, in their activities. I think that the, the way to go beyond sort of competition and, and fragmentation of, of, of academic theorizing is to go uh, to the practitioners and to practices that are uh, burning to, uh, to generate transformations that empower the practitioners and their, their clients. Anyway, so the change laboratory uh, is, a, is an approach or a method uh, which starts from the, 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 the premise that in an activity system or perhaps multiple interacting activity systems, uh, there are serious challenges. <laughs> and needs for transformation. Um, in other words, the, the very starting point of this type of research and, and intervention is that there is a need in uh, an activity setting. Um, oftentimes this, uh, this might be even uh, something close to a crisis. Um, and when the... Uh, access and collaborative arrangement uh, between researchers and the practitioners is, is, is uh, worked out. It involves um, field work, which is before the actual intervention begins, conducted to call it what, what we call mirror data uh, on various manifestations of the challenge uh, in that setting. Uh, how they are manifested in practice and how they're experienced uh, by, the, by, the, by the practitioners. In the actual uh, intervention, we typically have maybe from six to 12 change laboratory sessions, typically lasting perhaps a couple of hours each, uh, often relatively uh, uh, regularly with, with regular intervals between them, and um, in which uh, initially the mirror data is presented or, or samples from that mirror data are presented to, to basically uh, uh, show to the participants their own troubles. And this way to trigger a conflict of motives uh, uh, that is anyway there, but to make it uh, visible uh, and, uh, and something that can be articulated and tackled together. Um, Participants typically analyze the historical development and the present uh, contradictions uh, in their activity system or activity systems, uh, trying to identify uh, where they come from, what are their root causes, uh, and how to actually um, uh, name and model them. They also uh, project a zone of proximal development for their collective activity and design uh, uh, a new model and new uh, solutions that uh, kind of pave the way toward this uh, uh, possible uh, zone of proximal development. And in the best case, we also are able to follow at least to some extent the implementation of these new models in practice, testing them uh, perhaps first in, in, uh, in specific spearhead projects and, and, uh, and possibly even implementing them in full scale. Uh, this type of process uh, takes time, but it's also uh, something which is uh, deliberately uh, kept intensive and, and compressed. Uh, it is, the aim is to shape this kind of intervention to generate an expansive learning cycle. Um, and I come to that in a minute. And for the research purposes, but also for the purposes of, of the actual um, 
uh, movement forward in the learning cycle. The sessions are videotaped and, and uh, typically even between the sessions, the researchers get, get uh, uh, into uh, preliminary analysis of all these all this, um, recorded sessions and, uh, and select excerpts to be shown in the next session. Uh, uh, so as to uh, address uh, issues that were left open or that uh, are, are uh, confrontational, conflictual. Uh, this type of uh, work from the uh, uh, interventionists, it requires quite a lot of, of focus during the, during the sessions, uh, during the, uh, the process of the actual change library intervention. And this uh, method was first time proposed and, and put into practice in 1995 in Finland. The, the very first uh, actual uh, change laboratory project was carried out in, in uh, post offices and uh, Finnish postal services. And um, uh, today there are over 30 countries in which uh, change laboratories have been conducted uh, and analyzed and, and published on. And uh, uh, it's a challenge in itself to try to keep track and understand this variety and, and diversity. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendously important potential source of learning. And uh, uh, it, uh, uh, we can talk about how to get access to this uh, work if, if you're interested in when we move on. Anyway, now, pictures of some of the early, early change laboratories uh, conducted in Finland since 1995. The very first one, the black and white on, on the upper left hand corner is from a post office. Uh, and then there's a middle school, uh, a hospital, uh, a bank, and so on. I have to say that today, I, I would say that most change laboratories are conducted in, in in uh, domains where there is a clear need to uh, address uh, burning societal issues, such as uh, issues of um, equity, uh, uh, issues of, of uh, uh, climate change, etc., the, which they are more and more, uh, in a way, penetrating all kinds of activities and all kinds of organizations. And so I think that uh, we, you will hear much more about this when Annalisa speaks, uh, how uh, change laboratories have been moving and are moving toward more and more, let's say, uh, burning societal uh, issues and, and challenges. Um, this is a sort of a, a, let's say, simplified floor plan or what might be the, the setting of a change laboratory. You have the practitioners uh, facing three surfaces. Uh, uh, one is the, the mirror where we uh, uh, present uh, uh, selected excerpts and, and parts of the data collected, uh, typically showing uh, problematic uh, situations or problematic experiences uh, in the activity. Um, on the on the left hand side, there are the models. Uh, typically, for instance, the uh, using the triangular. Uh, model of the activity system, but also other models often also constructed by the part participants to make sense of this, uh, of this data. And in the middle, there is a sort of a, an empty space for intermediate ideas and, and solutions. And, and uh, the, the very, no, very dynamic of a change laboratory uh, is moving uh, across and between these uh, surfaces. But not only uh, horizontally, but also in a sense in time, um, looking into the past, how these um, uh, problems, challenges uh, have emerged, what is their history, how is the situation now, and how it can be projected uh, uh, toward the future. Uh, this this uh, two way movement is essential. Um, and you can, uh, this, is a, this is an image uh, from a change conducted in a, in, a, in a primary healthcare center 
in which um, you know the the surfaces are very simply uh, white white boards uh, and uh, and uh, typically there is of course also um, uh, video recording uh, equipment involved and and a scribe who uh, uh, keeps uh, putting putting uh, ideas and and uh, um, statements onto the whiteboards and now <clears throat> what's important about this particular change lab in the picture is that also the patients were invited to to participate meaning that it became not only a change laboratory for the professional practitioners but also their patients who brought in a very different angle and perspective and often challenged the professional wisdom of the practitioners. Um, now, the change laboratory is built on, on two epistemological and methodological principles. One is the principle of what we call ascending from the abstract to the concrete, which directly leads to the idea of expansive learning. And this will be the main topic of my the rest of my talk. The second big principle is that of double stimulation, which leads to the idea of transformative agency. And this will be the, the focus of Annalisa's talk. Um, now, the ascending from the abstract to the concrete is a, is a bloody difficult notion. Uh, it comes from the dialectics uh, uh, in, the, in the dialectical philosophy uh, this is the considered a, a foundational method of, 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 uh, of analysis and, uh, and a method of dialectical thinking. <clears throat> Translated into uh, learning, it means that the, first of all, learning begins from anomalies or conflicts in the essentially experienced uh, concrete. Concrete understood not as isolated things, but as the complex relations in which the subject is acting. So, uh, and this is often, as we know, our life worlds are uh, complex and fuzzy, and to make sense of them is not easy. Uh, and as Ilyenko, the main philosopher who has inspired activity theory, uh, wrote, the, this concreteness is initially experienced. It appears to the subject in some particular fragmentary manifestation that is abstractly. We can only uh, grab some part of the rich, concrete, uh, 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 lived um, uh, life world around us. Um, now, in empirical thinking, uh, we reduce this abstraction into, into a, a one-sided definition or a category. You know, typically imposing some already uh, available category on the reality, and this might be called reproductive learning. And this is uh, unfortunately the, the predominant mode of learning that we see, for instance, in school settings, typically, that uh, uh, we, we teach uh, children and adolescents uh, ready-made categories which are supposed to be put, put their world in order. Um, uh, at the same time, this also creates a situation that it's very difficult to go beyond what is already given to you. To go beyond that, we need to construct a different kind of abstraction that captures the origin of the phenomena under study, under scrutiny. Uh, uh, we might call this uh, a germ cell. A prime example of such an abstraction uh, is, is the idea of commodity uh, that Marx uh, developed as, as the sort of foundational explanatory principle and germ cell of the very complex formation uh, of capitalism. Uh, now, <clears throat> that the idea of a germ cell means that you try to find uh, the initial um, Gener genetic uh, principle and starting point uh, uh, of a complex uh, um, uh, uh, systemic phenomena. And, uh, and uh, it means that it, it becomes a starting point for ascending toward the, the complex uh, uh, manifestations uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the system that you're trying to understand. 
to to reach to to ascend with the help of the this this germs of abstraction to um, conceptually mastered concrete. As Ilenko says, the gene uh, the germ cell is the genetic basis uh, um, from um, the, uh, from which the development uh, all other just as particular phenomena of the given concrete system may be understood in their necessity. Uh, now, I will uh, shortly give you an example, which is hopefully much more down to earth and. Uh, and uh, gives uh, perhaps a, a sense that it is this is not uh, only um, philosophizing. This uh, comes from our fairly recent work in in the the, the domain of um, uh, home care for elderly people living alone at home uh, uh, who are frail and often have multiple illnesses. Um, when we um, studied this situation of the home care in Helsinki, um, we realized that uh, most of the care uh, was focused on uh, very simple basic needs like, um, you know, uh, nutrition, uh, medication, and hygiene. Basically taking care in a brief home care visits this, uh, of these three things that uh, the old person is uh, appropriately fed, that the place is clean enough and that the medication is given. At the same time, some very uh, foundational needs uh, were set aside because there simply wasn't time for them. And one of them was the issue of mobility. Elderly people uh, uh, tend to lose their mobility. And you can imagine that here in Finland, it's particularly uh, challenging because uh, a large part of the year we have snow and ice. And if an old person who is fragile and doesn't have very good balance starts walking on an icy street, uh, he or she is likely to fall and break her hip and be hospitalized or institutionalized for the rest of her life uh, very easily. In other words, there is a fear of falling, a fear of movement. At the same time, this fear of mobility, fear of movement itself generates immobility and increasing difficulties to move. Uh, it becomes a vicious circle. To break this vicious circle, you need a, something uh, like a germ cell that opens up a new, new uh, uh, perspective of possibilities. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we introduced uh, various kinds of, uh, of uh, mobility exercises in, uh, in these um, home care encounters. And observing and video taping them, we started to realize that one particular uh, exercise became foundational, and that is simply standing up from the chair. Uh, standing up from the chair is in some ways that it's the initial, you can't do much, much else unless you do that. It's kind of the first step to mobility. You got to stand up. Secondly, it's very, very important that you see that it's an internally contradictory very uh, uh, movement because it, it kind of crystallizes and embodies the, the contradiction between the quest for safety and the quest for autonomy. The quest for safety appears uh, as a, the motive of, of fear of falling. I don't want to move because it's, it's dangerous. And the quest for autonomy appears as the motive of I need to move. And these two are continuously uh, in conflict. There is a deep conflict of motives among old people living at home. And uh, what standing up from the chair does, and it, that's quite interesting, is, is that it in a way makes it very visible. If you stand up from the chair by um, using the, your hands uh, to support you, you're using the arm, uh, uh, arm, uh, arms of your chair or or the table as the support. Like in the in the picture here on the left, the old person is using uh, the the chair as her support. But you can also do it so that you don't use the support, and then you make your own muscles and your uh, your especially your thigh muscles stronger and you learn to balance yourself better it's an 
<clears throat> it's uh, the issue is not to choose one of the over the other, but to move smartly between them. If you are very tired, or if you deep, uh, if you are sitting in a very deep chair, you might indeed use the the your hands as as supports. But on the other hand, if you want to gain more autonomy and more mobility, you need to actually uh, do this uh, uh, sit ups or uh, uh, standing up from the chair movements purposefully and systematically. Um, this very simple idea that uh, um, that um, the germ cell of sustainable mobility among elderly people living at home um, could be standing up from the chair is is it's very important to notice that first of all this is not the sort of a fancy verbal idea it is very embodied and physical and 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 something that uh, is crystallized in a simple action that opens up the gateway to all kinds of other movement and uh, um, the ascending from the abstract to the concrete here, uh, you know, uh, it uh, takes the shape of, of first, you know, questioning why, why can't I move? Is it is it really sensible that I don't move? Uh, analyzing what is preventing me, and then taking this uh, germ cell abstraction. In this case, the the standing up uh, from the chair deliberately as a as a as a something that with which you can change the situation and uh, the trails in this picture the the six different trails are actual uh, uh, movements toward the concrete for instance um, uh, the old person um, starts um, to observe her own posture uh, looking at how <coughs> straight her posture is when she stands up or she may actually start using uh, uh, very simple um, um, uh, artifacts to, to help her to take these uh, exercises. For instance, one of our uh, uh, subjects in this study said that I, when I set up my, my, the table for my dinner, I, uh, nowadays I, I uh, kind of forget to put a couple of utensils there. So that means that I have to stand up and go and pick them up. So in a way, she uses the forgetting of the utensils as a, um, what, what we might say, um, a prompt to take this action of standing up from the chair. Uh, this is something that will be uh, more um, systematically discussed by analysts later, how this kind of, simple artifactual prompts can be used to enhance a volitional action to go beyond the the current state now now what does this all have to do with expansive learning and the um, first thing is that learning is embedded in transformations in activity systems this is a uh, expansive learning. It is not just sitting in the classroom or uh, uh, listening to a lecture or reading a book. It is getting involved in transforming your own activity, your own uh, collective activity, which is facing some sort of transformation or trouble that uh, requires that it's changed. So it's not uh, the expansive learning is not meant to cover all forms of learning. It is a very sp specific kind of learning and a very demanding one. <clears throat> and it's this type of learning is driven. by contradictions in the present activity. Then think about it as a joint journey across a collective zone of proximal development. Zone of proximal development here meaning um, 
the zone of possibilities of transforming the activity and gaining some sort of an emancipatory uh, um, um, new, new uh, um, level of possibilities in your activity. It is also learning something that is not yet there. It requires that learning is understood as a collaborative creation of new models and concepts uh, and enacted patterns of activity. Um, and this, these new models, these, uh, these new patterns of activity are radically wider in terms of a, uh, a social uh, scope and patient. Uh, temporal duration and, and sustainability, and also ethical and political responsibility. Uh, if uh, we think uh, of, of, for instance, the, from the point of view of, of the home care worker, what happens when, when the traditional notion of the object of home care, which was just the basic needs of take care uh, of, of hygiene, uh, nutrition, and uh, and medication in, in a 15 minute visit. If, if you now start thinking of, uh -uh, there is the deep seated issue of mobility, which is connected to uh, the threat of loneliness and to the, the threat of memory loss. And these are radically bigger objects for home care than these uh, uh, basic uh, uh, task of uh, hygiene, uh, nutrition, and uh, and um, medication. Uh, this requires a very significant expansion of way of working, understanding what you are trying to achieve, with whom, and with ki what kind of time perspective. And it, it brings with it a different kind of ethical and political responsibility. Uh, expansive learning is also, it is never uh, just a sort of single perspective, single voice. It is multi-voiced learning in which people have to struggle, negotiate, and hybridize between different alternative ideas and perspectives and positions. This is very uh, important aspect of expansive learning. It is not only uh, learning in a sort of vertical sense, but also horizontal sense. And the expansive learning cycle is, in that sense, it's a process of resolving contradictions by means of learning actions that follow the logic of ascending from the abstract to the concrete. And in more um, uh, sort of systematically, uh, systematic terms, we're talking about learning actions in a sort of ideal typical model of, uh, model of the cycle of expansive learning, starting from questioning the current situation, analyzing where the trouble comes from, modeling a possible new solution or a germ cell if you want, examining and testing this new model, moving toward implementing it first, uh, perhaps uh, through uh, pilot projects and, uh, and eventually in a, in a larger scale, and reflecting on the process and consolidating and generalizing the new practice. This looks very linear, but in practice, it never is. Uh, typically, this kind of a expansive process uh, involves uh, iterations, uh, breakdowns, uh, uh, obstacles, moving backward, and, and sometimes falling apart. Uh, it is not an easy process. And it involves multiple scales. Um, in, a, in a change laboratory, the expansive learning process that we aim at generating and supporting is typically, you know, we think about it in a few, in terms of a few months, possibly perhaps a year. Uh, and this is a, what, what might be called the, the sort of intermediate um, scale of expansive learning. Uh, the scale of months and perhaps some years. Uh, it's typically a local transformation of the concept and, and, and uh, mode of the activity uh, that may spread and may be uh, uh, emulated or, or um, 
uh, used by others, but it basically starts in a local setting. <clears throat> but then typically this is, uh, it, it, this includes this kind of a, a cycle of expansive learning includes mini cycles or micro cycles uh, uh, that may last uh, minutes or hours, uh, or perhaps days, which uh, uh, may require a very different kind of more fine grained analysis. A recent paper that we produced uh, uh, together with the Jana Numiuki and an analysis on Nino in 2018 in the Journal of the Learning Sciences is a study of, of this, this kind of very short microcycles, uh, also from the home care uh, uh, context. Uh, but then there is the bigger uh, scale, the whole um, sort of historical transformation of the mode of, of the activity, the mode of production in the activity. Uh, you, you, would, you could say that this is a macro scale, a cycle uh, or a scale of history. Uh, you know, if, if we succeed in transforming the, the whole concept and way of conducting home care, for instance, in the city of Helsinki, this would be that kind of sort of historical shift. And I would say that we are sort of going that in that direction, but it's not uh, at all certain that that will actually be uh, accomplished. Uh, now, <clears throat> when you plan a change laboratory, you need to keep in mind three variations, uh, uh, three versions of the expansive cycle. One is the fact that, you know, Whenever you start an intervention in, in some activity or some uh, uh, field of multiple activities, uh, you need to know what happened before. What was the preceding cycle like? Where, and where is the activity at the moment in its current cycle of development? You know, it's very different if you enter when people have just already designed their own new model or if you enter at the beginning when they feel that they are in a crisis. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's important to understand where the, the, the movement of, of the, the transformation, the historical transformation of the given activity is when you enter. Otherwise you might easily sort of uh, start acting as if you know how they should be. <laughs> uh, if you don't, carefully study their own history. Uh, the second uh, thing is that also you need to figure out how your uh, intervention, the, the change laboratory is going to move. Which learning actions do you want to accomplish in the different phases of the intervention and how? In other words, you plan the cycle. And then there's the third variation, namely what actually happens in the intervention. And you can be sure that it, uh, it's not exactly what you planned. And that's a very good thing because it would be pretty boring if, it if you could just simply execute what you planned. And so, hey, they did exactly what I wanted. They never do. Or if, they, if it looks like that, you are fooling yourself. Uh, in other words, you need to carefully study from, uh, your data to figure out which learning actions did the participants actually perform and how uh, did their actions differ from the ones that you had planned and, and, and intended. In other words, these deviations from the intentions of the interventionist are extremely important because there you can see the emerging agency of the, of the learners or the pr pr practitioners themselves. Uh, here's an example of an analysis in, in uh, this is a part of the paper that I think was actually uh, recommended for you as a, as a reading, um, a paper from 2013. It's from a university library in, at the University of Helsinki uh, in which a change laboratory, laboratory was conducted. And you can see that <clears throat> it initially, um, there was a, um, it looked like it's going as planned, but then some participants, when we had already created a new model for the activity, you know, in this particular library, it was a question of, of how, what do you do when 
when researchers don't go to library anymore. They only use the, the internet to, to get access to what they need. So how the library could become a, a partner for researchers uh, in their, in their um, work with the information. And, and th this would require an entirely new vision for what the library is. The traditional vision was that library is a place where you get books. And now they needed to reinvent what is an academic library, so to speak. And they had already constructed a model, but then they started to question it themselves. And they returned to questioning, uh, kind of conducted another cycle. And, um, and the, this is the thicker, um, thicker arrows. Uh, and, and in a way, it was a new cycle initiated by the participants themselves in which they questioned their own model, kind of abandoned it and created a new one. Um, and started implementing that one. And that is not so rare. Uh, and it's very important to understand that it's uh, uh, these deviations um, from what you as a researcher interventionist have uh, designed are not something that you can uh, somehow eliminate but you have to engage in negotiation and, and eventually it is their activity. So planning a change laboratory, planning the expansive learning cycle, it must be carefully planned. You should know what, which learning action is aimed at at any given moment in a change laboratory, but it doesn't follow the plan. However, the, the fact that you have a plan allows you to identify when there is a deviation from it. They are very important, these deviations, windows into the formation of transformative agency among the participants. And the plan itself can be considered as a second stimulus. It enables you to act, but it must be continuously challenged, revised, and readjusted. Now, I'm coming to the end. I, I wonder if I have very much exceeded the, the time. Probably yes, but I'm, I'm actually coming to the end. Uh, I we were asked, Annalisa and myself, we were asked to, to address the question, what kinds of research knowledge does a change laboratory produce? And um, I would say that there are four types of knowledge uh, that, that it produces. One is new solutions to local challenges. Uh, and you will see when Annalisa speaks that um, she's going to talk about um, uh, working with homeless, with the homeless, and particularly an example of uh, conducting a change laboratory in a supported housing unit for formerly hom homeless youngsters. And in that case, the local solution was a solution to overcome fear and confrontation in this working culture, in this environment. And that is knowledge in itself that can be very important for various other actors and, and activity systems in the same field, of course. But it's basically solutions to local challenges. Then there is new conceptualizations and modes of implementation of policies and principles. In Annalisa's uh, case, uh, the, uh, the multiple change laboratories conducted in the area of homelessness led to the reconceptualization of the very principle of Housing First, uh, something that became called Housing First 2.0. And in the, in the case of this, um, uh, 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 home care for the elderly, which I've been talking about, uh, it has led to uh, the principle of sustainable mobility for elderly home care clients by means of uh, what is called a mobility agreement. And now it already covers nearly 10,000 clients in the city of Helsinki. They are not anymore just local solutions, but they are 
conceptualizations and modes of implementation of entire policies and principles. And then the, the more perhaps uh, familiar uh, uh, type of knowledge, the new theoretical insights into the processes of learning and agency, which is the, the, you know, the, the very foundational um, task of, of this type of research. Uh, we talk about intermediate concepts, how um, the general theory of, let's say, expansive learning is continuously tested and, uh, and enriched by new intermediate conceptualizations and, and insights. And um, finally, also new methodological insights into the ways of designing, conducting, and analyzing formative interventions. At uh, these uh, four types of, of knowledge, I think uh, we can discuss them and, and perhaps give concrete examples of them. Um, but this is connected to the notion of what is the design of uh, research. And this is a very complex uh, image. And we, we hopefully we can return to this in the discussion. But the, the idea is that the change laboratory in itself is a critical, let's say, um, generator of new type of knowledge, new types of, of insights um, that feed in to, on the other hand, in the, in the real activities that we're studying as uh, possible new uh, solutions and, and models for the activity. And on the other hand, uh, it feeds to the theory, uh, in this case, uh, the uh, cultural historical activity theory and, and the, the theory of expansive learning and transformative agency. Uh, it, mostly it, 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 it feeds the theory through uh, uh, by creating intermediate theoretical concepts when the, when the data collected is, uh, is uh, meeting uh, existing conceptualizations and uh, new concepts are needed to make sense of the new data. Uh, I will, uh, uh, be happy to return to this if needed, but at the end, I, I'm, I'm just mentioning here that there are a good number of methods of analyzing change laboratory data that have been now developed and, and used in various uh, studies. Uh, typically, the precondition is that you collect careful data, that you actually uh, typically minimally uh, record preferably video record, uh, but minimally at least audio record, all the sessions of the change laboratory, uh, create a transcript and analyze that transcript, preferably as a whole cycle rather than as uh, just fragments. Uh, and um, we can return to these types of analysis. Uh, and also, of course, I will share this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation with the, with the list of references uh, so that uh, you can also take a look at them later. So uh, for the time being, this is where I want to stop. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I have already exceeded my time, but uh, if you have a couple of some uh, immediate questions or, or comments, I would be happy to respond. And then we can maybe have a couple of minutes break. Thanks, Sergio. That's been described already in the text chat as superb. I have to say I agree. So does anyone have any questions? Um, either say so in the chat um, if you want me to read them or uh, let me know now. Um, I can I can start with one, Sergio, uh, which is you, you talked a lot about the role of of starting from local knowledge and you know you don't know how they're going to be um, and yet what you're asking these people to do when they're dealing with germ cells it's not actually the dominant mode of thinking in our society no. is it um, and neither is presumably many of the other things we're using as second stimuli like the triangle diagram these are actually quite new to most participants so what's been your experience of actually getting participants in somewhat challenging settings to use these things to produce knowledge. How are you dealing with that as an interventionist? I think that we can also, uh, I'm, I'm sure Annalisa has also quite 
a lot of insights on this because these uh, instruments are also used as second stimuli, like you pointed out, and, and uh, they, they can be, if they are adopted and appropriated by the participants, they can be very powerful for uh, you know, breaking out of the given situation and seeing potential uh, uh, new solutions. But uh, overall, it's a, it's a very <laughs> it's a very contradictory uh, issue because you know, oftentimes the best examples of of adopting and appropriating actively, for instance, the the, the triangular uh, model of activity system, come from practitioners who are really hands on. Uh, so, um, they, one of my best experiences has been with, uh, with janitorial cleaners and, uh, and uh, most recently we observed this very, very powerfully also with the, with the practitioners who work directly with the homeless in a, in a, in a, in a um, supported housing unit. But when you move up in the hierarchy to more, let's say, uh, managerial positions or, or so on, it becomes uh, more difficult, uh, peculiarly. I guess because it's for, it's for them, it's more difficult to see what's, what are the actual um, elements or components in a given activity. Um, and uh, uh, so that they, there is a temptation then to treat the model only as an abstraction rather than filling it with life. And, and so, uh, and the funniest thing is that uh, very recently, a colleague from um, uh, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, uh, Professor uh, Fernanda Liberali, she sent us a, a wonderful set of photos where she had been using the triangles with, with favela children who ages between uh, eight and 12, roughly, who were uh, analyzing uh, why things are going badly in their favela. And, uh, and using them, uh, some sometimes drawing them even on the ground, uh, uh, and uh, with, there was no paper available, and and uh, and I was just astonished uh, because it it somehow speaks about the that this type of uh, theoretical instruments are meant to be bloody practical. They are not meant just uh, for academic uh, discourse and debate. They are meant to be actual instruments for transforming practices, and if, the the. The more distance you have, the more difficult is to is to turn them into that. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of long and short uh, uh, about that. Uh, basically, of course, there are moments when people just don't want to adopt and and, and use the models that you offer. Then it's uh, the challenge is to is to find ways to use their own models and to and to put them into into use. Thanks. I mean, so the actual answer to these senior managers is to say, look, even a child can do it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> um, Tyler, that's the way, Tyler, to, you can that's the way to get the, get the conflict with them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, you have your hand. Uh, yes. Thanks, Brett. Uh, well, thank you. I uh, manage the uh, Think Lab program and work with Catherine here at the University of Cambridge. So we're quite indebted to all the work that you do. And we're doing a Think Lab project right now um, using some of the principles and theories that you've outlined. I have a more like kind of just general and I guess um, very uh, like, you know, very 2021 sort of question that uh, we're doing all of this online. So um, it is all kind of remote and like there's certainly a different dynamic, right? When it comes to, you know, like a lot of us haven't met in person, our, our you know, partners and people that we're working with, it's just different, right? Um, we have some thoughts, but it's a, it is a challenge for sure. I'm just curious based on your own research, what have you noticed in terms of like how these dynamics change when everything is remote, when it's all, you know, this is as close as we're gonna get, which in some ways is good. Get to see you from Finland, amazing, but in other ways tough, right? Because it, it's hard to get to know someone and build that sense of community. Yeah. I'm glad you took this up because it's it's um, this challenge has come um, to our knowledge in in from multiple directions. We have a a, a group of colleagues in Sweden who are conducting a, a a major series of change laboratories in a in a couple of municipalities who want to conduct them in all their schools. And suddenly, in the middle of the project came the COVID and and uh, the the transition to entirely uh, uh, um, digital is is very hard and tough, 
Uh, and I think that the, you, you know you are experiencing exactly the same thing. And we are uh, trying to actually now uh, um, promote a, a dialogue between uh, colleagues in different parts of the world who are doing this transition um, to exchange and perhaps uh, uh, synthesize some ideas of what it takes and what kinds of uh, possibilities it opens. Because right now, I think it's, uh, I can't answer your question. I can only speculate uh, that to do that, I think we need actual, we first need to do it. It's like Leontief said, there are things which you, you, you know only after you have done them. <laughs> and right now, I mean, I mean we can uh, think about all kinds of wonderful uh, potentials of various digital uh, media, um, not just the Zoom, but the many other instruments, but uh, in the end, it's uh, about how to put this all together and not abandon the original principles. <laughs> uh, so that's a new equation. Uh, I can only say that I would really love to hear how you're doing with it and, and what kinds of uh, insights you're gaining. Yeah, we'll send you notes as we yeah, go. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of demand for that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so Kula was posing a question in the chat, and I think she can ask that now. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm based at the Institute of Educational Technology um, at the Open University. And I would like to know, uh, I mean, one of the assumptions that I have about the Change Lab is that, um, you know, the participants in, in this process, they trust each other and they are open about hearing about troubling issues about their organization or the team, and they are re really motivated to, to change. So how, how can you make a change lab work when there are really strong hierarchies and very strong power dynamics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. And, and frequently also encountered indeed. Um, I think that you know one of the key issues is to to get from the very beginning negotiate this openly and and frankly with also those who hold the power uh, because if you start to change laboratory laboratory only with those who are kind of lower in the hierarchy and then at some point they realize that the people on the top are not going to listen to them. Uh, that's a disservice to everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly. a, so it's better to get this negotiation um, started right at the beginning. And we have some very good experiences of, of top managers who decided to actually join in. And we had to ask the other participants, is this going to be uh, detrimental? Are you, mm -hmm. Is this going to censor your ideas? In some cases, they said yes. In some cases, they say no. Let this guy join in. This way, we can make sure that something will actually happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I would say that there is no simple answer to this, except, in my opinion, to get all the key stakeholders, e even the most powerful ones, on, uh, around the table and and make it clear that there is no sense to make this if we don't have enough common ground to uh, uh, to allow. Uh, this process to unfold without knowing ahead of time what will be the end result. This mm -hmm. is the kind of risk that people, all the people need to be committed to take. Okay. Uh, if they don't, they, they, if they're not willing. Uh, then you shouldn't do it, you mean? Yeah, well, then then I think you can say, uh, let's return to it uh, if, if, you, if you are willing later. But at the moment, it makes no sense because you are, we don't want to reproduce uh, a situation where the, the management says, okay, I've listened to your ideas now, but they are not really very, uh, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. realistic, etc. This is uh, something that you don't want to put people through this. They have already been through that many times in any case. Yes. And may I ask one more, which I think is related to that. And I, I'm always wondering what is the, um, what is the role and what is the, the profile of the interventionist in this process? Uh, especially in relation to the question that I asked about the, the power <laughs> dynamics and the hierarchies, and what is the the kind of like what is it that we are looking for? Uh, the interventionist is a provocateur and a protector. You mm -hmm. have to provoke in order to 
get the uh, you know get make people face the contradictions that they are willing to take the tough uh, stuff that you know that uh, especially when you have relatively powerful professionals like medical doctors you often mm -hmm. the first reaction is to them ah this is an exception uh, why do you show us this uh, exceptional cases and then you show two or three and four and then they realize that every uh, freaking case is exception mm -hmm. that, that, that actually uh, uh, this uh, argument doesn't fly anymore uh, or you bring in a patient who says hey you're killing me <laughs> that makes them uh, uh, rethink, uh, but uh, uh, then the the so that's the provocateur role. But mm -hmm. then there is the protector role that you have to be there to protect the weaker ones, those who are usually silenced, and to make sure that they are not silenced. In other words, you have to make sure that it's an equitable and safe field that the part uh, that the the participants are not going to use it against each other that this is uh, you know in a way saying that the ground rule is that in this intervention you can say anything you want and it's not going to be held against you mm -hmm. uh, you know and to to make sure that that actually also happens yes it, you can never 100 percent secure it but i think you can do quite a lot <laughs> uh, so i think it's this dual role and then, of course, there's the third one that you also have to record it carefully in order to be uh, to analyze it. But that that's a mm -hmm. that's a different thing. I think that Annalisa will have a lot to say about that. In fact, one uh, she has a student now who is analyzing exactly the role of the intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, unfortunately, this is ongoing research, but I'm sure Annalisa has some something to say about it. Uh, I look forward to, to hearing about this. Thank you very much for your uh, responses. Uh, so we have one more question from Claire. We probably, given time, we probably have time for this question and maybe one more. So Claire's question next, perhaps. Yes, thank you. Um, a link question to the conversation we've just been having. I was wondering, wondering how comfortable you are with the idea of kind of modifications to a to the change lab methodology. Um, to um, I suppose to kind of make it work. So my um, particular example is I was commissioned to work in the NHS with a particular um, obstetrics and gynecology team where there was some really complicated issues about learning culture and practices. Um, and it was so complex at the beginning, I couldn't get doctors, nurses and midwives to agree to be in the same room together. Um, management very supportive. Um, and what we ended up doing, and in fact, I couldn't get senior doctors in the same room as the junior doctors, which kind of tells you what why perhaps I was there. Um, but what was really interesting is that we kind of went with the flow a bit and we did some uni professional conversations before we got into Change Lab proper. Um, we agreed that helped shape our historical analysis and identify tensions. And we got some agreement from them about what we could and couldn't take from that into the first um, groups. But we were really clear up the front that this had to be multi-voiced and we wouldn't do that. Um, I think my biz biggest success on the project was getting them in the same room and actually being called out one day by one of the participants because they were so keen to suggest something that they were all going to implement. Somebody said, oh yes, but the person that it matters to most isn't in the room and we can't impose that upon her. And um, I've kind of I've missed that moment. But we had to change and adapt in a lot of ways. And I don't know if what we did was, it certainly wasn't purist change lab. I think it borrowed some principles and practices but I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are about how flexible and adaptable you can be in order to make it work in particular settings. Uh, to put it very briefly, you know, um, in my opinion, the important thing is that the researcher, when, when, you, when you do this, when you modify and, and uh, take per, perhaps uh, partial elements from the uh, existing uh, sort of change lab framework mm -hmm. that you are uh, open and clear about it that you say for this and these reasons we did that and that okay. and and uh, you know what i don't like is that somebody comes and said we did a change lab and it turns out that they did one session and that's it you know uh, uh, it, it it's it's very strange to me i mean why don't you just say that we did one session which borrowed some ideas from the change lab yeah, uh, yeah. i'm i'm simply saying that uh, it is not a magic bullet that you have to somehow uh, you know uh, uh, 
religion to replicate. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we, we should have the open uh, and frank, uh, um, you know, uh, way to report what we have done and why, and say, okay, like you just said, that uh, yes, we we for this and these reasons and in this and these circumstances we did this and this and it uh, was useful to take some ideas from the change laboratory li literature and change laboratory practices and uh, you know whether you want to call it a change lab or stop calling it a change lab at some point i think it's it's a judgment call yeah and there is no simple measure for that yeah. uh, but uh, but basically, I think that the main thing is to be to be open about what you did and why. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you. There are no more questions in the chat, so um, I'm happy to move to the next phase. Now, I think we discussed um, beforehand that we might introduce a five minute uh, break around this. Oh, no, I can now see Catherine's got her hand up. <laughs> so. Catherine, I'm being sneaky. <laughs> Sorry, I probably shouldn't ask, but no, that really that fascinates me. It's a great question from Claire. So one of the things that, that so um, what we're trying to do with the change laboratory is to use it to train doctoral students. So to bring them together and to so on maths, we're kind of a larger research team effectively running the change lab. But I'd really appreciate your views on mirror data. So we find it fascinating if we bring the researchers and quite a lot of them sometimes to be the research group and to collect the mirror data together. Um, often kind of when we say that the, the change laboratory started because so much learning happens in, in how difficult that is and, and who do you reach and who do you ask and, and those. So we're finding sort of playing a little bit with that collection of mirror data and who does, because it's quite a power thing sometimes if it is just the researchers, where if the participants get involved in that seems um, interesting. Anyway, I'd appreciate your views because it's probably not what we should be doing, but. <laughs> I think, you know, the, the mirror data is often indeed, uh, if you're an outsider, it's not necessarily easy to collect because access becomes a problem and trust can become a problem and so on. So if the participants can themselves collect significant parts of the mirror data it's great and and uh, uh, in any case it's mirror data should not be understood in a sense that it's something that's only before the sessions it can be only also collected all through the process so uh, basically i think that the critical issue is what kind of data do you do you collect because you have to try to identify at least tentatively what might be the critical situations or critical questions that you ask that can somehow lead you to the to the core contradictions. That's the that's the difficulty. Uh, and sometimes the problem is that you simply cannot do observations. You only have to do interviews, uh, and uh, that that can be that can be also a challenge because then uh, you know if you do only interviews, you probably have to do quite a bit so that they they don't become just accidental anecdotes and. Uh, uh, Basically, uh, I would be very open to various ways of, of, of collecting mi mirror data and, and using it. Uh, it uh, to me, the main issue is to find um, something that you can see gains traction among the participants and start uh, things moving. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks, Sergio. Um, I think what I'll suggest we do now is to break for five minutes so that people can take the usual comfort breaks. So we'll reconvene. Uh, let's make it uh, 4.30 UK time. So in that six minutes, and then we will move on to Annalisa's presentation. Okay, so Excellent. I look forward to seeing you again soon. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think we um, have everyone back in the room now, if we're happy to. Okay, lovely. Thank you um, so much for that was really interesting interactive session. And it'd be great now to hear from Annalisa, um, particularly focusing on transformative agency. So over to you, Annalisa. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing this event. I'm so pleased to see also some familiar names uh, in the 
in the list of participants. Uh, so hello, everyone. Nice to, to meet you, really. Uh, OK, so um, some uh, contents have been already touched upon uh, in uh, the discussion and in the presentation um, of Yuria, but um, I, will, uh, um, I will talk a little bit more about uh, the current work we are doing in RESET, uh, which is uh, the, the research group I lead at Tampere University in the Faculty of Education and Culture. Uh, so um, let's start a little bit uh, with uh, my favorite definition of, of the change laboratory. The change laboratory is a method that serves the purpose of participatory analysis, concept formation, and design. Um, and it is a method that supports accelerated expansive learning and transformation. Why accelerated? Because while well, expansive learning happens uh, all the time, whether we do change laboratories or not, also transformative agency happens all the time. But perhaps with this, the use of this method, we can accelerate these processes, we can make them compact and coherent, and uh, um, we can, uh, we can uh, provoke some change, which otherwise might take more time to, to unfold. Um, Yuri has already mentioned these two uh, principles, two epistemological principles, which also are key uh, components of a comprehensive definition of uh, what a change laboratory is. Why they are so important in, in change laboratories is that uh, they serve as constant guide leading uh, principles uh, for the interventionists to make uh, decisions uh, throughout the process. Um, so um, in the discussion, Kaula was uh, referring to, um, to the, the question of what are we looking for? Well, what my answer to this question would be that we are looking for to uh, unfold uh, to see unfolding and to contribute to the unfolding of an expansive learning process. And also, um, we, uh, we hope to see um, agency um, manifested and undertaken throughout this, uh, this process. In fact, uh, uh, you can't have an expansive learning process without uh, uh, significant uh, uh, steps uh, in transformative agency because each step of the learning cycle is a transformative action or a set of transformative actions. Uh, that's why it is quite uh, uh, um, quite an arduous process to, uh, to uh, see unfolding and to be involved in, not only as, a, as an interventionist, but also as a, as a practitioner. Um, so um, these are guiding principles. So the principle of double stimulation is one of them, and Yuri has covered this. Another principle is the principle of double stimulation, understood as a principle of uh, uh, agency. Why I have to emphasize that? Because the literature of double, of double stimulation is primarily a literature on mediation. And of course, a transformative agency by double stimulation is very much a, a process of mediation, but it is also a process of will formation and tangible changes that can be uh, connected with initiatives of the learners. So, um, this is the kind of work that has preoccupied me for some time now, and I will give a, a, give a short presentation on, on, my, uh, on my attempts at, uh, at clarifying what double stimulation is, um, 
what it has to do with the change laboratory and what it has to do uh, with uh, the theories of agency that are already available in the learning sciences, in educational sciences, but can also uh, perhaps uh, um, this principle can also contribute to significantly expand our understanding of agency and in particular how agency is formed as a process. Um, so you uh, probably are familiar with a couple of uh, publications uh, uh, on the change laboratory in which uh, the mm, principle of double stimulation um, is uh, uh, taken up um, very explicitly. There is this text from 2007 and this uh, volume uh, from uh, 2013. Um, at that time, uh, what I was primarily working on was uh, uh, on what Vygotsky had written on, on double stimulation. Um, I was particularly interested in kind of opening up uh, the principle, understanding what kind of uh, implications it could have for further development of activity theory and the change laboratory method. Um, and um, Vygotsky talks about the double stimulation in connection with the, um, the change laboratory, the, 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 sorry, the waiting experiment, uh, which was an experiment that he never did actually but uh, Kurt Levin did in Germany. And when they apparently met, Kurt Levin talked about this experiment uh, to Vygotsky. And this became the prototypical example for Vygotsky of double stimulation. A person is uh, um, coming to, uh, to help uh, a researcher to conduct an experiment and finds herself in a room in which nothing is happening. So uh, the person uh, asks herself, should I stay or should I leave? There is no one here, nothing is going on. Uh, I have other things to do with my time. So um, the person finds herself in a situation of conflict of motives. Should I stay or should I leave? At some point, the person turns to the uh, to the clock on the wall and says, when it's two o'clock sharp, I'm going to quit. And when it is actually two o'clock, when the, the, the clock strikes two, the person gets out immediately. Um, so we uh, decided to replicate this experiment, and we did so not only with individuals, but uh, with uh, the collectives. Why? Uh, the reason is obvious is that we were interested in understanding settings which were as close as possible to um, settings uh, of change laboratories in which often people feel uh, in situations of conflict or motives to tackle. So this is a picture from one of our experiments conducted with the collectives. Um, so this is what was going on during these years when these publications were, um, were coming out. And this took some time because it was, of course, a rather long process of digging into double stimulation. And this gives you a sense of um, the surprises, we, the pleasant surprises, uh, some of them pleasant, we found um, this is an example that is actually very close to what Vygotsky describes um, in his texts. Um, what, this is one individual in the experiment room um, and uh, in the uh, interview that we had um, uh, in which she was re-watching the, the video that we had taken of her waiting in the room, she said, you see, I had this cup of coffee, uh, so I thought that I will wait until I finish that and see the, the clock, it took just very few seconds between her finishing this, uh, drinking the last sips of the, the, the coffee, throwing the, the cup in the bean that was just under this chair and then leaving the, the room. So basically a textbook example of what Vygotsky had described in terms of the, with the, with the help of the clock. So um, 
through the years, this led to this uh, first uh, um, paper in 2015, uh, um, which we refer to as the core paper on, on double stimulation for uh, transformative agency, uh, in which I basically um, um, draw this, uh, uh, this uh, representation after the text of the that apparently he wrote in 1931, in which he uh, basically describes this uh, process uh, that volitional action um, uh, stems from um, facing a conflict of motive understood as a first stimulus, then um, the conflict uh, um, might be faced by the person deciding to take up a, um, an auxiliary motive or a second stimulus. In the case of the prototypical example of Vygotsky, it was the clock. In the case of the example I just showed you was the cup of coffee. So the person decided at some point to respond to the conflict of motive, to face to the, the conflict of motive by using the, the second stimulus. But nothing has still happened in the world. Um, then the moment happens when the clock strikes actually two o'clock and when the person coffee ends. So this is what Vygotsky refers to as the reopening of the conflict of motive, when the conflict of motive is reactivated. And this is the really delicate moment when something might happen or might not happen. And when the person really uh, undertakes the second stimulus as a, a way out of the conflict of motive, the action uh, is implemented very, very smoothly, uh, as if uh, uh, it was without any doubt, the person would be without any doubt anymore between staying or leaving. Now, um, Vygotsky also says that we should not consider this as a mechanical uh, process, but as a process in which there are often rates iterations and different variations. And this is essential in a process of deliberate self-conditioning because this is what essentially uh, this process as described by Vygotsky is, is a process of self-conditioning, is a process of rethinking uh, uh, certain habits that uh, we might have. My favorite example, probably some of you have heard me presenting this example, is a, a person who is struggling to, um, to, um, to have a good diet and at the same time um, cracking for a good piece of, uh, of cake uh, uh, when uh, every time she has an opportunity to do, to do that. Now, it is not very easy to change a habit that kind, eating sweets, for instance. Although you know that it's good for you not to, to have sweets, and sometimes it's even uh, more than that, you can't have sweets, you should stay really away from them. It's very difficult to take, uh, to, to change this habit. And you do, in order to do that, Vygotsky says, you have to, um, to undertake a deliberate process of self-conditioning. It is you who determine with the help of certain artifacts to implement the, um, the second stimulus over and over again to the extent that at some point this becomes uh, totally natural. Um, so uh, a person might decide to put in her pocket at breakfast three little pieces of chocolate, very tiny three little pieces, pieces of chocolate and say, every time I am facing the real conflict of motive in the world, when I am uh, in a situation in which uh, the conflict of motive is reactivated in big way, because for instance, I am passing by the office of a friend, uh, of a colleague and the person say, hey, look, I have a good, uh, a good box of chocolates here. Why you don't take, take one or two? or a piece of cake. And then you say, no, look, I have already taken two of my little pieces of chocolate and I can only take that amount of it uh, per day. So you have a resource, which is material here with you that helps you to face the conflict of motive, to overcome the paralysis. And this is um, a habit that you might want to, uh, to nourish over 
time. So um, it is not a mechanical process and it undertakes, it, it requires uh, some reiterations uh, most of the time. Now, this is the point where really uh, the, the where it, this is really the critical uh, moment in a process of transformative agency by double stimulation. And uh, my favorite example to illustrate that is uh, uh, from Mohammed Ali. I don't count my sit ups, I only start counting when it starts hurting because they are the only ones that count. So you need to have these um, ammunition with you um, if you want to uh, uh, undertake a process of transformative agency by stimulation, if you want to overcome uh, conflict between having to train and feeling lazy, lazy to train, then you need to have these ammunition with you that can help um, uh, at the right time when it hurts uh, to, uh, to overcome the, the paralysis and to get into the movement. And every time the fact that you have um, put into use the second stimulus may reinforce the whole process. So what are the strengths that I see uh, in, this, in this process of TADs? We call them TADs uh, since uh, the, the article that you read was, was published the last year. Uh, it allows tracing the unfolding of transformative agency by double stimulation as a process with a specific starting point um, that can be, and this process can be reconstructed then it helps expanding the notion of agency from inner psychological properties to, uh, to, uh, toward external artifacts. So the fact that, uh, uh, and this is said by Vygotsky uh, himself in several instances, the fact that we see an artifact being put into use gives us a very strong indication that something is happening and you can actually trace it. So in terms of reconstructing a process of um, agency formation, I think this model might be very useful. Uh, at least this is something that I have been trying to to uh, always um, realize a, a, very, um, a very thorough and detailed analysis of how agents, agency unfolds. Because as educators, um, in order to be able to support learners in their process of transformative agency um, and in the process of expansive learning, uh, we need to be able to understand these processes uh, also as processes of agency formation. But uh, before this model uh, was found, uh, it was very difficult actually for me to, uh, to tackle the issue of agency as a process. And uh, uh, now, what the, all this has to do with the change laboratory and with expansive learning? Well, expansive learning is a Hopefully, we'll get Annalisa back soon. Oh, in their uh, actions. Annalisa, yeah. you need to repeat your last yeah, sentence. We just lost you. Just for oh. a minute. Okay, so uh, expansive learning is a cycle of learning actions, and each one of these actions are very hard to undertake, especially by collectives. So the process of transformative agency by double stimulation can actually inform the way interventionists could uh, trigger or support the, um, the um, undertaking of this uh, transformative actions. So we see, um, at least since a couple of years now, we see increasingly the expansive learning cycle and the transformative agency process as mutual Actually inducing one another. This was already very much in the, the, in the original literature on, uh, on the change laboratory, but primarily uh, in connection with the, the, um, the questioning and analysis phase. But we are seeing that, in fact, this process of transformative agency by double stimulation really applies to the entire, the entire cycle. 
and even across the cycles. And I will come this, uh, to this very, very soon. So uh, we usually uh, come to a change laboratory with ammunition. And these ammunition are often uh, the triangles that they, you know, but they are also uh, other tools that uh, uh, are characteristic of uh, the set of uh, resources that we have in the change laboratory method. Um, so these are potential second stimuli that uh, might be offered. But then again, the, prop, the, the point is, are they going to use them when the moment comes? Are they going to use them when it can when when it hurts, like in the in the example of uh, of uh, Muhammad Ali? So um, these are the second stimuli. But what about the first stimuli? Let's go step by step. Uh, we know how crucial in the process of transformative agency by double stimulation is the uh, first step, which is the first stimulus, which is the conflict of motive, and uh, how do they look like these conflict of motives in a change laboratories? This is a change laboratory which is particularly dear to me. It was in conducting in a high school um, in um, the mid 2000s in Italy. And, uh, um, and uh, this is uh, um, uh, an example of how the conflict the motives was uh, was brought into the open uh, in the change laboratory uh, session number one. A teacher um, de uh, described uh, the, the work in the in the school as teachers being in trenches. And another one uh, said that we are in general we in general do this on the battlefield, referring to their classrooms as the battlefield. And when we were looking at this video recording to prepare the second session, we were really uh, pretty uh, surprised by this, uh, by this language. So we returned to the session with our ammunition, in a, in a way, <laughs> um, trying to open up the conflict of motive, bringing it into the open. And we asked them after showing the, the video recording of the session number one, against whom are you fighting? And the technical assistant who was one of the participants said, each one of us has uh, some aim that for one reason or another has collapsed. At the end, you realize, referring to the slides uh, with the video clip were uh, presented, that you are fighting. With whom am I fighting? With myself, with my personal dissatisfaction. And this led to um, the opening up of the conflict of motive that became very crucial for what happened afterward in the, in the change laboratory. Um, so we call these video clips, as most of you probably know, mirror materials. And they serve the purpose of bringing the conflict of motive into the open. This is another example uh, from a change laboratory in a hospital. This is what happened in session number one. The researcher said uh, this, is, this was actually uh, a case uh, which was uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, very difficult because uh, uh, the operating theaters were closed um, very, very often and there were very long queues uh, for uh, people to be treated. So, uh, of course, this was one of the main points of the mirror materials, and uh, the researcher referred to these mirror materials in the discussion and said, how do the surgeons uh, um, take it that the theaters are closed? And they responded in the following way, it is a red flag, it is really bad. It is all the bad that can that can be on earth. And one other uh, said, it doesn't make sense to educate people to work and then we don't let them work. And they are sick patients as much as anyone can count and then they don't get treated. So it is a completely idiotic system that is generally the reason to hospital to found hospital that they would get to treat the patient and then uh, the operation management says this is not easy 
easy for me either. I find it crazy situation that we have to do it like this. So the conflict of motive was brought into the open between wanting to serve the, the society by operating those who are in need and on the other end, not being able to do this because of systemic constraints within the organization. So what do these uh, examples tell us? that conflict of motives are heavily emotionally charged statements to which uh, uh, we uh, interventionists and analysts of change laboratory data must pay particular attention. Crucial to both uh, uh, unleashing the process of transformative agency and therefore to push forward the learning cycle. So at each step we might encounter paralysis that uh, um, um, in which uh, in which people feel stuck between opposite motives and they can actually evolve throughout the change laboratory these uh, conflict of motives as i will um, explain shortly so this is really the starting point of uh, transformative agency uh, by double stimulation in the change laboratory context so number one, pay very much attention to this type of statements because they are crucial to support the learning and agency formation process. But be also very much careful about these statements because we are not psychologists. Um, in fact, I am, but uh, I'm not serving as a psychologist in, in this type of settings. So um, these are also danger zones. Uh, these moments uh, of uh, statements, emotional statements of conflict of motive. Uh, why? Because it is very, very easy uh, for people to feel inadequate, to feel that they are not up to the, to the tasks, uh, they are not up to the complexity of the work environment in which they are. And it is therefore very important, and the method of the change laboratory supports that, to move from this action level to the systemic level. This is why in order to face the uh, conflict of motives, it is strongly recommended to use the uh, triangle of the activity system. Why? Because it shifts the mode from the action level to the system level. And it situates these statements and troubles within a much more complex setup of contradictions uh, evolving throughout the history of the activity. And then when you have analyzed that, people will feel that they are not really the only one responsible for all the troubles that other colleagues and their organizations are experiencing. And then this also can serve as a starting point for the analysis and the modeling uh, of the present, uh, the present activity activity toward the future development and design. So um, here we have some of the basic tools, the very main, main tools, the very key tools of a change laboratory are these three. Uh, the cycle of expansive learning, you know, uh, the triangle of the activity system, you know, and then you have also this, uh, which is more um, known as uh, um, our way to, uh, to uh, sum up uh, uh, analysis and uh, convey the results of our analysis. But in fact, uh, usually this stem directly from the change laboratory. And I think that the literature is not sufficiently clear about, about that, at least not, uh, not so far. It has been not very clear about that. In fact, the fourth field is a very key instrument of designing the future in a change laboratory context. We call this the zone of proximal development. We, after the analysis of the past and the present activity, uh, we also move toward um, uh, envisioning the, active, the future activity. Sometimes we use the triangle for that. Sometimes we just move to the fourth field. And what do we do with that? We start with one single possible line of developing, development. Uh, we ask the participants 
think about the situation in your um, school or in your organization now. How would you like to see this uh, organization looking like five years from now? But development is never linear. Definitely not in activity theory, it's not seen as linear, it's seen as dialectical, it's seen as complex. So at least one other dimension should be, uh, should be added to uh, this one. For instance, uh, in uh, a housing unit uh, for uh, young people with a history of homelessness um, uh, that we have been working with since 2018 now, um, uh, in the change laboratory, uh, they said that the situation now is that work with these young people as, guard, as guards, as controllers, and we would like to, from in five years from now, to actually um, work much more as coaches and fellow travelers, because the idea is that these young people don't get stuck in this unit, but actually become independent with the help of our coaching. And then when they move out in their own apartments afterward, and they have started studying or having found work, we can also continue becoming their a uh, reference point and become fellow travelers for them. But then we said, okay, this, is, uh, this seems to be a very good, uh, reasonable pro uh, projection because actually you are very much on the way toward that, but is that all? And of course, people were very much uh, puzzled by, uh, by this question, what do you mean? So we had to give them a little bit of a help. And again, the help came from the mirror materials. The mirror materials uh, in one of the interviews showed the manager of this unit um, expressing a, a worry that uh, now good steps toward this de development were um, on the way. So she could see the is uh, perhaps as realistic. And this was confirmed when everybody in the unit uh, worked with, uh, um, uh, with the change laboratory up to this point. But then she said also, and, and her worry was that this would become a very well functioning unit uh, within its walls. But what about the rest of the world? After all, this projection toward the future implies that these people go away from the unit and they start uh, living an um, independent life and, uh, and uh, uh, autonomous functional life in a world in which they are um, highly stigmatized and their history is always um, uh, uh, attached to them as a stigma. So uh, she said, we don't want to, uh, to become, to remain a clam, closed like a clam. And so this developed into a second direction, a second dimension of development, which was basically moving from being a well-functioning unit within our wall from the clam representation toward becoming catalyzers of change within the neighborhood and the society at large. So the idea was that the unit would open up toward the, the society, to the society with the help of all kinds of initiatives. And this in, so they, we have been draw, the, um, we have been designing the, uh, this area, as the crucial area of proximal development from, for the unit. So they should foster this idea of becoming coaches and then um, fellow travelers and at the same time become visible in the society, in the neighborhood, so that other people from outside would not consider these people as a problem, which is usually how they experience these neighbors, uh, the rowdy neighbors and, uh, and uh, um, loud uh, and sometimes disruptive neighbors. So um, the idea was that they would start all kinds of projects, which was the outcome of the change laboratory and they would have this orientation toward the future as the main direction for development. So this four field gives uh, 
gives uh, uh, an idea of where you are in the development of your organization. They felt that they were they started here and then they were moving very nicely toward the, that direction, but they wanted to be in this part of the four field. So everything that would be undertaken project and as a collective initiative in the next five years should be actually located within this, uh, this area of the, the four field. Okay, so we have also one other tool, which is probably not known as it should be, uh, but it is extremely important one, which is the history wall. Before starting uh, um, uh, with the, the uh, analysis of the past, this can be a very good um, transition uh, for uh, people to understand uh, what is each other view of the development of the unit during very crucial years uh, or moments of its history. Here you can see um, uh, this is Anne Lequeros who, who works uh, with us in Creole, and this is myself behind the video camera. And these are the some of the practitioners involved in the change laboratory, and they were reconstructing their experience of the past year in the unit, which was a very turbulent one. That's why we decided to zoom into this particular history of, of the unit. And this led to uh, to a very nice momentum in, in the process. This was one of the ammunition I was referring to uh, in order to try to push forward the, the learning and the agency process. Now, I need to also um, tell a little bit more about double stimulation understood as a warping uh, movement and second stimuli understood as anchoring forward instruments. So, um, Anchors are usually understood as stabilizing device to, um, to prevent a vessel from moving, but there are also other types of, uh, of anchors which are called the kedge anchors. And these are uh, anchors used uh, in navigation uh, for the purpose of what is called warping. So uh, what is warping? Warping is pulling the anchors once it has settled on the ground for moving the vessel away from the problem area, for instance, when the vessel has to be moved against the wind. Now, in change laboratories, we often are in this situation. We often are in the middle of a storm in the open sea. So the idea is to throw cage anchors Mm, this can be a uh, potential second stimuli, the triangle, even the cycle of expansive learning can serve this, this purpose in the right of, mm, moments. And then uh, definitely the, 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 um, the wall, the history wall and, uh, and the, uh, the four field, uh, they can actually have uh, important functions as sketches to push forward the, mo the, the movement uh, or in the cycle of expansive learning and to uh, undertake each transformative learning action. So the second stimulus can be considered as an anchor and a successfully implemented second stimulus in Tad's process may be understood as a warping anchor that eats the ground and allows the vessel to move forward. Now, if your anchor is thrown, but doesn't hit the ground, uh, you better take it away. You better not insist on that because you do not want to lose the momentum. So understanding when the anchor hits the ground, when the participants are really receptive of the second stimulus that you might uh, suggest them, or you might be receptive yourself, of some second stimuli that they are offering uh, spontaneously. Um, so this is a process of step-by-step -step material grounding in the attempt to transcend troubled activities. So uh, 
I give you a quick example of warping in the waiting experiment. Um, the, the participants in this uh, collective started looking for um, uh, material support, both uh, uh, the gaze of these participants and the explicit statements indicated that. And of course, all these indicated their conflict of motive between shall we stay or shall we leave? Now, there were a number of uh, um, uh, second stimuli opportunity that were thrown by uh, different participants. Uh, for instance, N2, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, N2 brought the idea of writing a note. This is N2 writing a note to the experimenter. But the other two were not into that. They said, we are fine waiting, so this is OK. Then one other participant said, well, I have a question about the course. And this became actually a, um, a second stimulus which eat the ground. And we have evidence of it. It's not you decide, I, it was not me who decided that this was a second stimulus, but there is evidence that this question served the purpose of keeping these people in the room, filling the room with meaning that they didn't see at the beginning. And that's why they were facing the, the conflict of motive. So uh, this was a search action from N3 that uh, hit the ground. But then the discussion eventually ended. And here again, N2 started returning to her idea of writing a note to the experimenter and leave. Because, and this is the evidence that this was a second stimulus for her, because in the of some other meaningful topic of discussion, she was rather oriented to leave. We have this on the tape, actually. So this is the moment when the conflict of motive is reactivated. What are they going to do? After some resistance, actually, N2 uh, won. And uh, uh, this participant started writing the, uh, the note. Uh, notice that N2 actually um, gave the notebook, uh, her own notebook to the other participant for him to collaboratively, collaboratively write, writing with her the note. So the second stimulus was constructed together by, by the two participants. At this point, um, the, uh, the entry was still just uh, looking. She was very attentive and she didn't protest. Now, as soon as this note was written, and you can see here the note, you will find us at the restaurant, they wrote. They left the room in matters of seconds. So this is again, you can see the clock here, just 35 seconds lapsed between the ending of the note and the, the writing of the note and them leaving, which is quite a record because they had all the bags still here, um, uh, as you can see, and here they are leaving with their bags. So it was super fast. Again, we see the, the model of, uh, of Vygotsky implemented even with, with the collectives. What we learned from this uh, um, experiment is that second stimuli can be actually um, uh, multiple ones in the same episode of transformative agency. So uh, now um, an example from a change laboratory in the youth housing unit uh, that I mentioned uh, already uh, before. Um, this is these are pictures from this change laboratory, uh, six sessions that run from uh, February 2019 to April 2019. The process started already in November 2018 when we started the field work in the unit and continues. The follow ups are still continuing today because this is meant to be a fourth generation um, change laboratory effort in which we build the long term partnerships on very acute societal challenges, in this case, uh, homelessness. And uh, 
um, so this is how uh, the process unfolded here. Of course, I am sketching this uh, complex analysis in, in one slide, just to give you a sense of what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, the, the, the core of it is. So the problem at the beginning was between safety and uh, uh, having, um, uh, having a safe environment to work in, and also having the possibility to interact with the, 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 um, uh, the, the young people in this unit uh, um, in a meaningful way for them to develop toward independence in their, in their, in their lives. Uh, so this was the main conflict. And this was also very much a tense, uh, a very tense period in the life of the unit, because some people cons considered the transformation that the unit had undertaken independently already before the change laboratory started uh, as an achievement, while other, other participants considered this a total failure that brought uh, that put the, uh, the employees at high risk. Some of the employees felt that uh, the transformation in the unit, uh, which basically consisted in knocking down uh, some, uh, uh, some of the walls in the unit that separated uh, the young people in the, uh, in the base of the unit, young people uh, living in the unit and the employees, so that they could be together. And some of these employees consider this extremely risky. They preferred working uh, behind a plexiglass um, so that they would feel safe in case of possible aggressions from, from the clients. So uh, we used the the, the, the the history wall, and it worked extremely well to the point that the history wall started uh, becoming a resource for the collective of the, the entire unit and for uh, making visible the history, the troubled history of the last year in the unit to visitors coming in the unit. In fact, this uh, was then moved away from the room in which we usually had the change laboratory to the entrance of the, the, the space in which usually visitors passed through. So this was one evidence that this second stimulus really hit the ground and was uh, uh, leading to a momentum of initiative and learning collectively in, in the unit. Uh, similar, uh, similar events happened with the, change, the, the use of the triangle of the activity system. Uh, we had, um, in the analysis with the help of the triangle, a conflict of motive experienced by the employees started to become a Parent between strict boundaries as safety measures and the residents' well being. So you can see that the conflict of motive here developed into something more specific. It was not anymore just uh, an achievement for the unit uh, or versus, uh, um, versus uh, uh, a failure for the, for the unit, but it was uh, more focused on the object of activity. And this it was definitely the, the outcome of using the triangle to zoom into the object of activity as the main force that keeps the, the system together. So the conflict of motive was reformulated here as between um, the strict boundaries as safety measures, boundaries between the residents and the employees, and then the residents well-being, the fact that the residents were not getting better, were not getting, were not progressing toward independence, became really a, 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 a clashing motive to the motive of protecting the employees and being selfish in that, in that sense that we, we want to be safe and in peace at work without, uh, without mingling too much with the residents. And this became really a very, very important moment of the, of the change laboratory, um, which may, was made possible by the use of this second stimulus when we analyzed with the triangle the past and the present of the activity. Then the fourth field was used later on and was constructed on the basis of the analysis of the past and present 
the activity of the unit. And this also took, um, this also hit the ground very powerfully. In fact, session four, five, and six are all based on that. And you can see in here these little arrows, which are all the projects, 15 in total, that the unit designed during the, the last two sessions of the change laboratory to forcefully move forward the direction of the fourth field I have mentioned before. So um, uh, now, I would like to tell a little bit before closing uh, about the fourth generation applications of, of the change laboratory method. The, the fourth generation activity theory focuses on faithful objects uh, that are object having far reaching and often disastrous consequences and implications for life across uh, boundaries. So definitely homelessness and the consequences of homelessness are uh, faithful objects. Um, now, the specificity of fourth generation change laboratories should be, uh, in our view, to support accelerated cross-sectoral and multi-level interorganizational learning, because of course you can't tackle faithful objects from the point of view of only local activity systems. Um, and then um, the first full-scale implementation of this uh, vision of future change laboratories uh, started exactly in this housing unit um, that I have briefly described and expanded uh, at the, the city level and at the national level with the two others interconnected change laboratories. So what we, um, we saw in the unit, what we, you see here is the loop that they made with the help of the, the change laboratory. So in fact, they had already moved from um, quite far in the zone of proxy in, the, in their expansive learning uh, with these blue arrows. They had done this process all alone up to the moment we came to the unit with the change laboratory. And then in their own design, because they designed this own representation of the learning that they had undertaken, they said that what they were really doing with us was this was taking a loop, looking at what had happened in the unit at their own design and seeing the extent to which these two could take off. And so now we are in these phases here of follow up and consolidation, which unfortunately were seriously disrupted with, by the COVID, but we can still see a very strong push uh, coming from this, uh, uh, from this uh, um, own, uh, expansive learning experience that I repeat started by the practitioners themselves in the unit. It was not uh, the, the, the change laboratory did support this process that was really, really initiated by themselves uh, already. But then what else happened? We, uh, so uh, we, we had in mind this idea of interconnected change laboratories, but uh, when we presented this idea to the city in which our university is, uh, the Reset University is, um, which was uh, our number one choice because we like to work uh, uh, very uh, tightly uh, in the settings in which uh, our uh, academic environments are located, uh, the city, in fact, was not that, uh, that interested. But what happened is that when the work in the unit became known, even people in the city became interested. And only at that point, what we hoped to realize as a second interconnected change laboratory took place. And these are picture from this second change laboratory that uh, took place uh, in the city of Tampere. In fact, uh, this is um, the, er the, 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 um, the place in which, uh, in the university, which we usually use for change laboratories. And uh, this, is, uh, um, this happened from uh, June 2019 
to um, uh, November 2019. So you could see that we had already almost completed the, the first follow-up of uh, the change laboratory in the housing unit when this became possible. And what we learned from this effort was that there were numerous examples of cross-fertilization between the two change labs. The work on uh, in the unit became actually a mega second stimulus for um, the, the work in the, in the city. So we saw really, and the data speak very clearly about that, uh, that the, the real source of transformation across organizations and sectors and hierarchical levels that were represented in the city level change laboratory with the healthcare involved, uh, with the housing services uh, involved, with, uh, um, with different NGOs operating in the area and so on, this was possible because the uh, the sources of transformation were really stemming from the workers initiatives uh, in close collaboration with their clients so the spontaneous expansive learning process that started in the unit actually had a very long tail of impact also in the city uh, change laboratory and we used uh, quite a lot of resources. Also ourselves, we use the resources coming from this change laboratory to support this other change laboratory. And then what happened at the city level? The learning at the city level functioned, functioned as a generative connecting link, which mobilized the holistic cross-sectoral vision while still remaining grounded in the needs of the frontline work and the clients. And this was again the merit of this first change laboratory and the mirror data coming from the first change laboratory because it kept all these administrators and the manager, some of them, um, uh, some of them uh, rather influential in at the city level, uh, grounded, grounded in the reality of uh, uh, collaboration between workers and the clients uh, uh, in housing units and beyond in the world of homelessness work. But uh, what was uh, what was interesting is that this happened at the city level. Uh, um, precisely because we could bring in these resources coming from from the the housing unit uh, housing unit itself so uh, it is very likely that this type of developments could not happen at the city level without this strong evidence coming from the the local level uh, and then the third change laboratory was also conducted because uh, there was uh, there was uh, information moving in the field, which is what okay. Finland is a small country, and they are. Uh, and this field is a very tight field in which uh, in which news uh, travel rather rather fast. So it became known the work that uh, had been accomplished uh, in the housing unit and what was happening at the city level. And therefore, um, also the, the a national level change laboratory became, became possible. Actually, the, the, the interaction became a little bit surprising because then the national level change laboratory uh, became a much more concrete possibility at the end before even the, 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 the uh, the temperature change laboratory could start. So there, there are these dynamics of also a little bit of, um, of uh, acceleration between, uh, between the different settings. So this is the national change laboratory that uh, started uh, again uh, uh, just a few days before the change laboratory at the city level. So that's what I was uh, referring to before. And here you have the representation of six different cities among the most, uh, the most uh, uh, important cities in the country in terms of uh, homelessness work and homelessness needs. And then uh, 
uh, also uh, numerous NGOs uh, and uh, um, also there were two ministries uh, in, involved. Uh, um, so um, the data analysis, of course, are still in progress. This is a massive amount of data that uh, were collected, and you understand that the type of analysis we aim at doing are very detailed. So this is a, a rather gigantic effort done, by the way, without, uh, without funding. And this analysis aim at informing the way in which uh, the three learning cycles intersected. The way we have depicted them in this, uh, in this representation uh, is still a broad hypothesis based on our uh, rough analysis of, of the data. But we'll see if, uh, if these interconnections are actually the ones that took place. And uh, preliminary results indicate that uh, the change laboratory in the city of Tampere was conducive to F at the national level and at the level of housing unit. So this became really a very important intermediate level and it coincided with the decision uh, by, the, by the government in Finland to give, um, to give the cities uh, the lead in uh, concrete uh, actions uh, toward eradicating homelessness. Before that, it was not uh, the responsibility of cities to uh, lead the process uh, at, uh, at the local level. So now this uh, um, change laboratory, uh, the results of this change laboratory that were published in 2020 and made public um, in the field in 20, in, what I mean, yeah, in March 2020, uh, have become a model for other cities as well, especially one particular innovation that was designed at the city level is now taken on by other cities in, in uh, the country. But also the, um, the result of, uh, of the national, national level change laboratory was, uh, was quite interesting because a proposal for, a nation, for an action plan um, for the nation to eradicate homelessness with a number of projects that should be prioritized was uh, uh, published and this uh, um, went under the name of uh, Asuntuensi Kaksi, uh, Kaksi Nolla, which in Finnish means uh, Housing First 2.0. As you know, this is uh, referring to the housing uh, strategy for which Finland is known uh, since 2008. Uh, but in fact, when these change laboratories uh, happened, this was a phase of rather uh, great uncertainty for the country uh, because there was no support from previous government to, um, to pursue uh, another um, program, nation nationwide bro program on homelessness, and this was quite, uh, quite uh, a disorienting phase for the field because since two thousand and eight, they had cons uh, they they were they had the subsequent uh, prog nation nationwide programs on homelessness. And suddenly, uh, the third one was coming to an end by the end of 2019, and there was no real prospects for, for the future. And then COVID came right after this. And now what is interesting is that the outcome of this change laboratory is probably the most comprehensive vision in right coming from the the, the practitioners uh, uh, in different cities, NGOs, uh, and organizations in the country directly. So um, this was quite, uh, quite a, a wonderful experience so far. Whether or not it will maintain traction, it's still to see. And in fact, the follow-ups, uh, as I said, of this process will take probably years because we will need to, we will need to carefully uh, document them and and then analyze them. Uh, so, this is uh, what I wanted to share with you. Hopefully, I didn't take too much time, and that's it. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Annalisa. Um, and in terms of impact, that's huge to reach a national level. So, um, 
Yeah, thank you for sharing. Lots of food for thought. Can I ask for questions? So I'll be looking at the chat, but also do please put your hand up if you have any questions. I have one in the interim while people are just thinking about that. Um, so mine is really, it is about the kind of the scale in terms of the number of participants you have and the learning that takes place and the tools that they then have to sort of take with them in their lives, particularly I think the housing unit, that's exciting. How do you see participants kind of surfacing and articulating what it is that they've gained in terms of the expansive learning and um, how do you see that framed and do they start to um, adopt using the models and the terminology or do they translate it into different forms? Um, the, the terminology that was utilized in, uh, in each one of these layers of change laboratories uh, uh, were radically different. Um, the housing unit uh, change laboratory was very, very spontaneous and sometimes uh, language that uh, we have never heard. <laughs> In, in change <laughs> laboratories uh, actually came up and it was great fun in fact and it was also uh, a very um, a very strong experience for me um, uh, particularly I would say because I saw um, this uh, participation growing and growing you probably have noticed that number of participants grew radically from the very first change laboratory in the housing unit to the last one. In the last change laboratory in the housing unit, the room was full. And even the night watch, the, the, uh, the, the practitioners who worked during the night shifts decided to come to the daytime to the change laboratory. So we really covered the entire unit and the work was done really collectively. Also, it is important to say that uh, some of these practitioners have a history of homelessness themselves. So this is how the process and also the, the language utilized became really very close to, uh, to the ground and to the daily life of working in a particular context. All right, thank you. Uh, Britt has a question and um, we're getting lots of thanks. There's a few people who've had to leave, but they just um, share their thanks because they've all found it fascinating. Uh, uh, to you, Brett. Thanks, Annalisa. It was a really interesting presentation. I think one of the things that I've seen in there, which is often really occluded in the literature, is how often there's a stimulus introduced, whether by the interventionist or by participants themselves, and it just fails. Um, you know, it, it doesn't find ground in your um, in your analogy. And I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about that failure, because actually it's not cost neutral, is it? Actually, if you try and do something and then it doesn't work out, that actually is quite a harmful thing for the participants. So what's been your experience of how participants deal with failing to find ground? And can we help them as interventionists? Um, I think we can, and I don't see uh, how could this be harmful. In fact, we, we do not know the outcomes of the process. This is what is distinctive of expansive learning. Um, we cannot know exactly what will work either. So we come in with a palette of resources that uh, we use and if they do not work, we take up, we take up something else. Um, the process is always um, difficult to predict from the beginning. So it is rather impossible to know whether or not something will work. When something doesn't work, it usually is replaced in one of the, the Perhaps the most, uh, the most eloquent example is uh, from the change laboratory that was conducted in, uh, in uh, a hospital in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, Els in, in uh, Finland. It was not actually in Helsinki. And the practitioners considered the triangle not what they 
needed. And in fact, it was absolutely, uh, I'm in absolute agreement with that because the discussion went into the peculiarity of the object of activity, which in their case was um, patients with multiple chronic illnesses. And one the, um, one of the uh, practitioners there came up with the amoeba uh, representation that you can see also in several of, uh, of the publications. Uh, uh, I think it was around the uh, mid-2000s uh, that this, uh, um, 2010 that this, uh, that this happens. And you can see that this is a depiction of their object of activity that they themselves created. And it was also extremely insightful for us interventionists to then put forward uh, next uh, set of, uh, of uh, instruments uh, based on this. Uh, on what the analysis of this particular model allowed to uh, develop. Because then it's like a chain. Uh, when an instrument fails, well, you re simply replace it. And at some point, one of the cages will hit the ground, uh, hopefully. Sometimes it even collapses the whole thing. We have changed laboratories that never, never ended, you actually could not end um, the cycle and could not uh, even uh, complete the, the set of uh, meetings that uh, we had planned. Uh, this is part of, uh, of doing this type of interventions. Uh, and I think it's good like this. But I like to say also that participants in change laboratories, uh, being uh, researchers or uh, practitioners themselves, never walk out of a change laboratory without gaining anything out of it. Because even if just leave little learning steps were undertaken and not the big designs were coming out of the process, it is still a learning process. They walk out knowing still a little bit more about themselves as professionals in this context and about the systemic uh, relations within their activity system or between activity systems involved. So it's always gaining something even from a failed change laboratory. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> Mike's just um, chipping into that conversation as well. I don't know if Mike wants to ask it himself. Yeah, I think that usually yeah. you are much more appealing than me, Yurio. So go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, sounds like agency is your B, finally, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I hope I will be able to contribute to the literature of, of agency in, uh, uh, in the learning sciences. This is what I would like to do. And I also would like to, um, uh, to perhaps explore the connections between agency and learning, which are very blurred still in this field, I would say. But perhaps through the lenses of, of expansive learning and now transformative agency by double stimulation, some aspects of this connection could, be, could become clear, could become visible. We'll see. Still work in progress. I, I, does, does Tyler have a hand up? I do, yes. Thanks. Wow, um, you have been with that hand since two hours. <laughs> I can't actually see my hand raised, but um, yes, thank you. That was a very fascinating um, presentation, really all of it that you mentioned and kind of inspiring in terms of just like the scope of change that is possible. Um, towards the end, like I was actually curious, like I'm trying to think how do I formulate this question, but when you were talking about sponta spontaneity and all of these things, like from a, like almost like a strategic standpoint, how do we optimize for spontaneity? I know that's a weird question, but like, you know, the old quote, the uh, Louis Pasteur, like chance uh, favors the prepared mind. How do we, how do we stru structure things so that we're best able to take advantage of those spontaneous things when they do occur in a process? My, my view on this is very simple. Just try to get off of you, everything that uh, has to do with academia in terms of uh, pompous hats and uh, uh, these uh, all kind of things that forget that you have, uh, you have uh, uh, certain types of concepts that you would like to see, uh, you know, flourishing, etc. And just try to learn 
from the people who are in this uh, in this change laboratory. I felt uh, that uh, that this worked particularly well because of this. Because uh, here we came in uh, seeing that you know. Uh, go ahead. We we find your work uh, your work valuable and interesting. And they were saying, "Do you mean that we have been learning already?" Well, of course. Just just look at yourself. What has what has happened? And then this was actually a very important starting point, because of course they felt, "What are these uh, people from the university uh, doing here?" I mean. We are, uh, these practitioners in particular, they often say, we, when we go to a dresser, we better not say where we work because the stigma affects us as well. So what are, what are these people wanting? At the beginning, they were also very, very strict in terms of, uh, of what we could do, what we could observe and what, uh, what we could um, uh, take as initiatives and, and what not. And it is totally fine. You have to build, you have to build the trust and uh, you have to have the modesty to decide that the best of your own research is to let the field speak for itself. Mm. And it is a struggle because it's a conflict of motive for us as well, because we have all kinds of, uh, of theories and assumptions that we come with uh, from the university. And I, I find myself always struggling with that. And this is one other reason why it is so important that you have your own plan so that you know what you are attempting at implementing and then afterward, when you watch the video, you know what has gone um, astray from your plan. Um, and this is what uh, um, this student we were referring to before is now looking at um, what happened in this uh, housing unit in this particular change laboratory um, is looking at the video before anything else, he has not yet seen the plans we had. And then he will be comparing what has happened in, the, in each session and the plans we had for each session. And it's important to mention that I, I think that it's very useful to write down at least the kind of a summary plan for each session, you know, one page perhaps. Or uh, if you if you don't do that, and at least record the the planning discussion, so that you can actually return uh, and look how how you wanted it to happen and how it actually happened. Uh, and this is a this is kind of a demand that you have to also treat yourself as uh, uh, as a research object uh, that. Uh, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, just afterwards explain that all oh, this went just as we wanted. Uh, in other words, that uh, documentation of your plans is very important. It's a. Uh, uh, I had a, a colleague, uh, Aaron Sikorel, who did a, uh, was a pioneer of, of of ethnographic research in medical settings, and and he often used to say that the problem is that uh, no video camera is capturing the interventionist. Uh, so <laughs> you you have to make sure that the interventionists' actions are also recorded. I also would like to add that uh, for me at least, uh, the making of these plans serves the pur purpose of when we discuss this plan within the research group before uh, a change laboratory session, the test of the plan is, are we forcing something on the the participants here? Are we leaving behind us all our books and assumptions and just trying to put these tools there at the service of the practitioners without loading them too heavily? It is an exercise of uh, almost uh, dispossessing yourself from what these models mean. It's not the time when you go for an intervention to um, come to, to load these models with this type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, assumptions. It's really not uh, the, the time for that. 
but after the after the 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 change laboratory is always completed and you have the recordings this is the time to bring it back did, it's, did, it's difficult <laughs> did, did mike have a question earlier but we might have skipped that i'm not sure whether it was a question or a comment i seem to have been infected by borgia's dispositionally type stuff and I find this critique crops up all the time when people are advocating a certain approach, whether it's in even in pedagogy, you know, how you might approach a certain situation. Uh, and then, you know, suddenly if you start unpicking it from the position of disposition, you find that actually you need a pretty special person to achieve what you're talking about. And, um, you know, so we're already starting to load up the things that the interventionist knows and can do. And so I just I was just aiming at that, really. Mm. Mm, one one thing is sure, uh, change laboratory are not advisable to be done by one person, by even by one very experienced researcher. Mm -hmm. You need colleagues with you and you need to um, to exchange all the time with them to double check what you're planning to do all the time with them during the session to actually interact with your colleagues. And when changes are made, quickly uh, agree just between yourself by looking at each other. It's, uh, it's really a collective process also from the point of view of the team of researchers. And that's, by the way, one of the difficulties probably with the with the virtual change laboratory, which uh, because the the intimate connection between the, for instance, multiple interventionists is not so easy, uh, perhaps. I just wonder if we're throwing postgraduates in this meeting. Yeah, Sorry. I was just going to retort that maybe we're throwing postgraduate research students under the bus if we expect them to do change labs um, as part of their thesis as, as, as a thesis methodology then? Well, in Finland, we have a good track of them and also around mm -hmm. the world. Uh, they are not alone, usually. They have a strong support by their teams um, and by their supervisors. So uh, I think that uh, it is totally uh, doable. Um, we know of cases in which this unfortunately did, did not succeed because there was not enough support from the faculty. That is for sure. And this is not advisable. Yeah, um, but yeah. Well, I just, make, I just make the point because it's interesting. I mean, obviously the model I've been familiar with, there are probably, I'm trying to count them and it's pretty tricky, but there are quite a few people in this call who are pretty much doing change laboratories as a single scholar, as a PhD student, but with the close support of a supervisor, which in some cases is me. Um, so that I think that's why Mike is, is laughing because it's kind of, there actually are plenty of PhD students um, doing a, a, a change lab on their own. Um, and that's, that's a pretty difficult thing, but I have to say it's never been posed in, terms, in the terms you've said. It's usually been posed in terms of I'm a junior member of staff in my institution, so I, I'm trying to deal with the power relations, that kind of thing. Mm. But how, yeah. how have you managed? I mean, that's, that's a good question, right? So in, in Finland, how are you managing the, the sense that young researchers might formulate these change laboratory research projects? Well, for us, it comes natural because uh, because this is uh, what we do since, uh, since well, in my case, uh, since 2005, in Yuri's case, uh, since 30 years. So uh, they, they grow in this uh, environment in which this comes spontaneously since they are doing their BAs. So when they, when they come up, usually they don't come up with ideas that are completely disconnected from what we have been doing. Uh, this is uh, because we, since always, we try to build research in terms of strong longitudinal partnerships with organizations, uh, schools, etc. So they usually enter this type of trajectories of development that have histories. Mm 
that's that's pretty significant but uh, also today i think if i look back i think that most of our let's say <laughs> successful phd students who did change laboratories are uh, are people who are indeed already professionals in some organization they are typically not in high positions but they are not absolute novices either so they have some um, you know um, experience and and competence in their field where they start the the change lab and i think that that has been uh, usually the kind of important element of a successful uh, intervention um, they but the i don't know how the situation is in your groups in uk i would like to hear i mean how what kind of what kind of organizations uh, and what kind of fields are your students or you yourselves <laughs> uh, working uh, in uh, is it is it mainly schools or is it uh, you, within universities and in what uh, what type of uh, what type of uh, uh, focus uh, do these change labs have that sounds like the agenda for a follow on meeting yeah sorry 100 <laughs> percent. that would be pretty yeah, yeah. Um, because it's it's so different we have here some um participants from south africa where they their change laboratories are very much oriented to to, to communities uh, uh, struggling with the, with the uh, with the uh, legacy of, of apartheid and and uh, and the, the total reorganization of the society uh, and then we we have another strong group in brazil where uh, where they they have entirely different set of of, of challenges so it is it is uh, uh, you know, uh, in a way, it's it's. Um, we have the risk that we're trying to impose our own cultural experience too much. Absolutely. Um, okay, with reference to time, um, there's always a challenge with these events. If they overrun too much, people keep you know the participants get fewer and fewer. So I'm going to guess we probably have time if we think of this for maybe three or so questions and if we could try and pose questions that maybe you know either relate to your context or bridge the two presentations those might be particularly useful. Um, now Tyler you've got your hand up again but last time that turned out to be an accident so. Sorry that was an accident. Okay, yeah that's ignore me. And I think Jane has a question. I don't think it was my question. I put in the chat, but I think it was Alison's question about virtual change labs. I think I didn't have a question. I was just saying that. Yeah, I sorry, Jane. Yeah, Alison. Elaborate. Yeah. Hi. I I really just wanted to reflect on a piece of work that um, I did where we had to adapt the change lab methodology um, to work on, in a pan-European project, and we we did some face-to-face -face sessions, which probably paid fast and loose with the actual methodology. Um, and then we adapted it to online. And one of the things that we observed was that um, rather than people being inhibited by the online space, they were very, very authentic um, and quite candid in the observations they made. So we were getting university lecturers um, in, a, in five European countries to talk about um, their attitudes to disability and um, equality of opportunity and how they reacted to difference in their classrooms and the the, the candor with which they were prepared to share their vulnerability using um, an anonymous online graffiti wall as part of the session was a lot more compelling than the very um, self-censored contributions we got during face-to-face -face sessions um, so i just thought I'd, i just thought i'd add that in um, we did write that up in a in a book chapter, um, which I'm I'm sort of nervous about sharing with the great man himself here, <laughs> um, because um, we did play fast and loose with it. <laughs> would be great to see that chapter. It would be very very interesting. I uh, I'm also curious that you mentioned that there was an anonymous graffiti wall. Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't know about that tool. That, yeah, that sounds wonderful. It's um, called dotstorming.com. Um, and we, 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 we tried um, Padlet and because we couldn't be uh, quite anonymous with that, we tried this dot storming and um, people were very candid 
and as I said, people were talking, were sharing attitudes that would normally not be, if you like, politically correct to share. Yeah, they were, they were, they were sharing their confusion and vulnerability about students with differences, um, rather than self-censoring and being politically correct. So it was quite interesting. Yeah. So that's amazing. It might be in that case that the 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 fact that it was done online rather than face to face uh, actually facilitated uh, uh, candor. Yes. Uh, which I never thought that that might happen, but you're <laughs> right. Uh, I never thought about the possibility of be remaining anonymous in some some uh, step, be, okay. which you can't do when you're face to face. You would have to wear masks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> uh, can I ask a question about resistance? So if I look at the two papers that were shared beforehand, um, I'd say the first paper, which was the one by Engstrom about the learning in the library, that's actually the conception of resistance I'm most, most familiar with in the change laboratory, which is we, we kind of valorize it. We say resistance is a good thing, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, it's a starting point for agency, these kind of things. But actually, when I look in Annalisa's paper, there's some what seems like quite bad resistance, or at least it's positioned that way, which is, um, you know, people basically not wanting to have that screen removed and, you know, resisting the direction of the change because of safety or whatever. But that wasn't positioned in as a kind of, as a changing, you know, that, that could have been uh, the interventionist saying, you know, that's a really good point and these are the practitioners and, and maybe they're going to get the trade union involved and, you know, all these kind of things and it's a safety issue. So how, how as a researcher, into, I, I assume one way we could look at resistance is to, retrospectively analyze you know once the intervention is done then you can kind of see what kind of resistance that was but as an interventionist in the in the moment is there a kind of worthy and unworthy resistance or how are we dealing with resistance in these situations do you see it's not a very clear question because it's a load of very good very good question very good question i think my my view on this is that uh, there was very little we could do about this, this wall. This wall was already knocked down when we entered the unit the first day. So we could not get it back <laughs> even if we wanted it. But beside, well, in my art, I felt that it was a very good thing uh, that they, they knocked it out because this created actually a momentum in the unit in which the, the, the practitioners realized how, how fruitful was this change. Uh, it took time, it took some struggles, but eventually this was a very, a very good thing, especially for the young people involved, uh, for, for whom the whole unit uh, has, now, has now the feeling of being home. And that's the idea, that the, that's their home. So uh, this resistance also, we, we really did not, uh, consider this as a part of a resistance uh, that would be particularly important for us to theorize on uh, because it was part of uh, the opposing, the opposing, the, oppos the clashing uh, motives um, that, uh, that were the starting point uh, of, of the old change laboratory. In a way, the resistance that we often reflect on uh, is the resistance uh, to uh, the change that is unfolding in the process of the change laboratory. But in that case, this was also already part of a year of struggle in the unit that had been dealt with among themselves. And we needed to be also in a way respectful of their achievements because ultimately this is their place and this is their unit. And, they, they, they are the owner of, of this context. But uh, I think that this, uh, this issue of resistance, it's a very, very dialectical notion. And it, it, I'm glad that you took it up because, you know, uh, obviously the researcher interventionist also has his or her own historical hypothesis of where this should be going. But at the same time, you have uh, this kind of resistance puts that uh, into question your own own hypothesis of the of the of the historical progress you know which which way is up which way is good is is going to be challenged with this kind of resistance uh, whether it's in a 
whether you've considered good or bad. And, and I think somehow dealing with it, coping with it is, is, is part of this. Uh, this uh, thing that uh, is critical is that if you find some action which in a way captures the germ cell of possibilities and I think that in in uh, this unit that Annalisa is talking about one of the practitioners said it very well it's encounters 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 we need to just encounter the clients and when that starts happening something emerges because they had previously been isolating themselves avoiding the encounters and now what they had launched like Annalisa said already before we entered the picture that they would have to encounter the clients and this uh, of course this aggravated the situation but it also opened up something to build on uh, you know the, the very simple idea that when you encounter uh, these people uh, who are rowdy uh, drunk uh, uh, sometimes aggressive etc et and you don't know what's happening uh, it, it 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 for instance it create we saw several instances uh, or we, we 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 were told several instances where very simple uh, forms of, uh, let's say, kind of double stimulation were spontaneously used by the, by the practitioners. You know, when, when th 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 things get rowdy, the, the very fact that you take a cup of coffee and offer it to somebody may change the situation. Or, or uh, that you start making porridge and, and inviting the others to join in. That the, this very, um, very simple, meaningful encounters when they are, you know, it's it's like an action of actually facing somebody who we have considered an alien and and starting to face this somebody as a as a person who happens to live here, like and they they also started to talk about is it we don't live here we this is not our home we just work here it's they who live here, and it's it's kind of like putting the the whole thing back to its feet. Uh, in a way, realizing that it's been upside down, we consider them as prisoners, even though this is their home. They have rental contracts, legally binding rental contracts, which, uh, like anybody, like you and me. So, uh, but so why do we treat them as prisoners? Basically, see so this kind of a, um, it's a very radical mind shift which required this encounters if you don't have these encounters it becomes just a sort of uh, being told what you have to do yeah absolutely uh yeah i mean i suppose the motivation is simply that i mean the the underlying ethos of activity theory as i understand it you know it comes from marxism and there's a lot of provocateur kind of stuff going on it would be sad if we ended up doing change laboratories as sort of management consultants coming in finding ways to overpower the workers opinions or something like that so you know that was that was kind of the the source of my worry but yeah i think that that mm. reframes it very well but it's uh, a it's a it's a legitimate worry and we, i think it's very good that you took it up because mm. easily you know we we start to think that we know the the right way up and 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 uh, you know uh, it's unfortunate that not that some of the practitioners just don't realize what's good for them. <laughs> okay, uh, looking at the time, I think we should uh, draw the session to a close. Sadly, uh, the, the the session is going to be recorded, and this will be I record many sessions. This will be one of the few where I will be genuinely going back and watching the recording afterwards. Um, so um, I I don't know if you. Okay, on behalf of myself and Catherine, I'd like to thank everyone who came. And I'd also like to thank very much both Annalisa and Erio for their very interesting presentations and even more for the very in-depth and engaging way they address the questions afterwards. I think everybody's found it very interesting and there's a lot of evidence of how much it's appreciated on the chat. So thank you all very much. It was great. Thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you. That thank was brilliant. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Be safe. Bye. 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 Bye.